The story begins, in a certain city, people were going about their everyday routine. A man just came home from work, so he decided to cool off by playing some video games. The next day, as he steps out, heading to work, he immediately has a cardiac arrest and he becomes unconscious. He suddenly wakes up in another world to the sound of voices, he opens his eyes to see a lady standing in front of him and he wonders who she is. The man wonders if he was somehow rushed to the hospital by a good Samaritan and the lady was the nurse on duty. He looks around and he thinks the hospital looks old. A dog starts barking, but it flies across the man's field of vision and the man is surprised to see a flying dog. A maid comes into the room with a tray to tell the lady her tea has been set and the lady thanks the maid. The maid tells the lady her son is cute and the man gets a look at his reflection on her tray. He can't believe he's now a baby and he wonders if he was dreaming. He was born in the 200th year of the summer 4th calendar and he was named Ars Luvent. He was born in Lamberg, which is in the province of Mission. Three years later, Ars has now grown considerably. He was in the study when a maid knocked on the door and he invited her in. She tells him she brought him some tea and he thanks her for it. He realized that he lost his life in his previous world and he was reincarnated as someone named Ars Luvent. Since his birth, he was able to master reading and writing skills, which made him knowledgeable about the new world. He knows he was born in the Summer Fourth Empire but he had never seen a map like that, which made him realize he was no longer on Earth. He also discovered there was a technique known as magic that people use to conjure mysterious phenomena. He thought the world was just like a game. The Luvent family he was born into was a noble household and they were in charge of managing a small region called Lambert. Their house was so big and beautiful that Ars thought it was a castle. They had a lot of servants to always look after them, and a live and chef who made delicious meals for them every day. Ars was glad he was reincarnated into such fortune, since his birth he also learned that he possessed the power that nobody else did. Ars walks into the training room, which surprises all the soldiers. He greets them and asks them if he can watch them from the safety of the entrance. The soldiers tell him he'll be fine at such a distance. They are surprised the prince was always coming to the training room at such a young age. They were convinced he would be a great warrior when he grew up. Ars walks over to a master teaching a trainee soldier. The master knocks the trainee down and he scolds him, but the trainee gets back up and decides to have another go. Ars uses his appraisal skill on the trainee to look at his stats. He realizes the trainee has great aptitude in archery, and he figures out that the trainee will be good with bows. The master knows the trainee back and the trainee looks exhausted. Ars approaches Malay the trainee and calls out to him, which surprises Malay because he didn't think Ars knew his name. Ars asks him if he's ever used a bow, but Malay tells him he will never use such a weapon because a real man doesn't shoot his enemies from a safe distance like a wuss. Ars tries suggesting that he may be able to handle a bow very well, and he asks him to try it. Malay chews on his thoughts, but when other soldiers ask him to try it just as Ars suggested, he decides to give it a shot. Malay picks up a bow and arrow, but he confesses that he's never shot one before. A soldier suggests he goes closer to the target to reduce the risk of hurting others, but Ars is confident he can hit the target from his position. Malay notches the arrow and he aims the bow at the target. He lets the arrow fly and it hits the bull's eye. They think it was pure dumb luck, so they asked him to try again. Malay shoots several arrows and they all hit the bull's eye. All the soldiers around him tell him he was born to be an archer, and Malay conveniently realizes that using a bow isn't so bad, since all is fair in war. The soldiers wonder how Ars was able to figure out that Malay will be good with a bow, and he tells them it was his instinct. The soldiers are impressed by this, but Ars knows if he told them the truth about his appraisal skill, they wouldn't believe him. Though his ability was the real deal, he was not able to use it on himself, which he wasn't very happy about. During dinner time, Ars was impressed with the meal prepared by the chef. He was about to dig in when his father called out to him. His father tells him he was informed of how Ars discovered Malay's talent with a bow and he was impressed. Ars was a bit scared of his father because he always looked so angry. Ars uses his appraisal skill to look at his father's stats. He was impressed that his father was able to rise from a farmer to a noble using his martial arts prowess. His father tells him to hone his instincts because he could become the lord of the land one day, his father was convinced the ability to detect other people's talent would be useful to him in the future. His father offers him his portion of the dinner so he can grow up quicker, and Ars thanks him for that. After that day, Ars studied more about the empire and he realized that the future was a bit vague because the leaders were corrupt, several revolts were coming up amongst the commoners, and various nobles were focusing on autonomy to quell the revolts. Ars feared that the empire might enter an all-out war if things don't change for the better. 
He couldn't envision himself leading his troops to war, and he wonders if he'll be able to keep the people of Lambert safe. He wanted to protect them because they were so kind to him. He remembers his father's words about his instincts, and he immediately gets an idea. He wears a costume and he goes out on the streets. He immediately uses his appraisal skills to check out the stats of the people in the town. He is exhausted after using his skill for a long time, and he sits in an alley. A woman suddenly chases a man out of her shop because she doesn't want to sell her goods to him. Ars figures out that the man doesn't look like the people in his town. A boy points at the man, who is a Malkian and he tries to get his mom to help him, but everyone avoids him because he's filthy. Ars remembers that the Malkian are a group of people that came to Summerforth from across the sea. He knows that most of them were brought in as slaves, so he decides to offer the man his bread. Everyone wonders why the heir to House Luvent is helping Malkian. The man takes the bread and he begins eating with tears rolling down his face, Ars uses his appraisal skill on the man, and he's surprised to see that his stats are almost perfect. He knows that the man can become a great warrior, but the man gets up to leave after thanking him for the bread. Ars chases after him, but the man tells him not to follow him because the people of the town will be angry. Ars asks the man if he'll want to become his retainer, which surprises the man. Ars was planning to use his ability to recruit people with potential so his domain will become stronger. The man thinks Ars just wanted to pretend, but Ars introduces himself and shows him his family crest. The man is surprised, but Ars tells him he wants him to become his retainer because he senses he has a lot of talent, but man wonders how Ars was able to sense that and they just met, but Ars tells him it's just something he knows. The man tells him he doesn't want to cause him any trouble because people won't like him taking a Malkian as his retainer. Ars tells him not to worry about that because he'll think of something, but the man rejects his offer and walks away. Ars keeps chasing after the man because he knows he may never find someone else with such stats. The man's stomach growls, and Ars decides to use that as leverage. He tells the man they have a chef who can make him a buffet of the food he'll love to eat. The man stops in his tracks and he decides to follow Ars home. Ars takes him home, and he can't believe Ars is truly the son of the Lord. The chef serves them some food, but they serve the man a smaller portion because he's a Malkian. Tell the Malkian to leave their house immediately after his meal, and Ars realizes the prejudice against Malkins runs very deep. He realizes he won't be able to talk the servants out of it, so he decides to share his food with the man, which surprises everyone. The maids decide to serve the man a better dish, and he eats his fill. Ars wonders what Ritsu the Malkian was doing in the village and Ritsu tells him he was once a member of a band of mercenaries. He tells Ars they disbanded after most of them lost their lives, and he's been wandering ever since. Ars wonders why he didn't join another mercenary group, and Ritsu tells him he wasn't hired because he didn't have any accolades to his name. The servant suggests that it's time for Ritsu to leave, but Ars tells them he brought Ritsu home to make him his retainer. The servants tell him that Lord Raven will disapprove, but Ars takes the matter to him anyway. His father tells him it's unacceptable to make a Malkin his retainer, but Ars tells him they'll waste Ritsu's potential if they throw him out. His father reminds him that Malkins are inferior to them, so no Malkin have any special talent. Ars is disappointed that his father believes the conventional information about Malkins, but he tries to convince him otherwise. He asks his father to test Ritsu if he likes, and his father wonders why he's so sure of his talent. His father remembers he discovered Malay's talent, and he decides to test Ritsu since Ars insists. He tells Ars he'll employ Ritsu as a soldier if he turns out to be talented, and Ars thanks him for this. His father tells him the test will be a mock battle between him and Ritsu, and Ritsu will be employed if he's able to beat him. Ars tries to convince his father that Ritsu is no match for him because he's so young, but his father reminds him that he said Ritsu was talented. His father decides to give Ritsu a handicap to make up for the difference in prowess, and he tells him they can proceed since he understands the terms. They walk out of the room and Ritsu wonders why Ars is trying so hard to make him his retainer. He thinks Ars is showing him pity, but Ars is wonders if he doesn't want to become their retainer. He tells him he can call it off if he wants, but Ritsu tells him it's the best offer he's received in his life. He thinks the offer is unbelievable because Mockins are usually persecuted everywhere they go. Ars tells him he needs him because he's going to become the lord of the land one day and he'll need Ritsu by his side. Ritsu assures him that he'll do his best. Ritsu goes into the training room and the soldiers realize he's a Malkian. Ars's father asks Malay to prepare their swords, while Gratz brings an hourglass. He tells Ritsu to pick up a sword, and he tells him if he can land a single blow on him before the time runs out, he wins. 
Ars thinks Ritsu has the odds in his favor. Ars's father tells Ritsu to introduce himself before they duel, and after Ritsu does so, he introduces himself as Lord Raven. The duel begins and Lord Raven strikes first, but Ritsu gets out of the way in time. He's convinced he'll have been sliced in half, even if they're using practice swords. The duel continues, and Ars realizes that Ritsu doesn't stand a chance, but the soldiers are surprised that he's able to hold his sword against Lord Raven. Though Ritsu was keeping up with Lord Raven, he was not able to land a hit on him. Lord Raven lands a hit that sends him to the ground, but he gets back up. Lord Raven reminds him that he has little time left and Ritsu remembers Ars saying he needs him. He decides to go all out and he rushes at Lord Raven's, he slides under and then uses the sunlight to his advantage to try to land a hit on Lord Raven, but he blocks just in time. Lord Raven announces that the battle is over, but Ritsu looks back to see the hourglass still running. Everyone realizes that Ritsu was able to graze Lord Raven's, and they wonder who he is. True to his word, Lord Raven decides to employ him as a soldier and Ars runs over to congratulate him on his employment. Lord Raven tells Ars his ability to sense people's prowess is top tier, and that he's confident Ars will fare well in the upcoming chaotic age. He's confident Ars will make a great lord someday. Meanwhile, all the soldiers wonder how Ritsu became so strong and they flock around him hoping to learn his secret. Later that day, Ritsu changes into his new clothes and he promises to repay his debt to Ars with his life. The story continues, it has been several months now since Ritsu began working in the Levant house. He trained with the soldiers each day and all the soldiers were amazed by his skills. Though he was partaking in the war, he always stayed beside Ars. His intelligence skyrocketed after he started taking lessons and after some time Ars used his appraisal ability on him. He was impressed to find out that Ritsu is now the most intelligent person in their house. Everyone quickly accepted Ritsu after they got to know him more and saw how gifted he was. The maids in the house were pleased to have him around and they were also impressed by his skills and intellect. Ritsu approaches Ars and he asks him for a new lesson for that day, Ars agrees to help him study. Ritsu reminds Ars that their previous lesson covered the activities of the Summer Fourth Empire whose aim was to reunite the seven original nations. Ritsu recalls that Ars told him that Ansel, which is geographically isolated from the other regions, was involved in commercial activities with regions outside Summer Fourth. They did this to gain enough power to invade the other kingdoms in the Summer Fourth region. After Ansel conquered the other regions, the King of Ansel declared himself as the Emperor and he named the region Summer Fourth. This was 203 years ago and Ars confirms all that he has said. Ritsu continues saying the current Summer Fourth Empire is in decline because the current Emperor is only 8 years old. This meant that his vassals were the ones with actual power, since the Emperor was going to rule on his own. This spread corruption amongst the government which led to revolts around the country, this made the dukes of each duchy ignore the empire as a whole and focus on autonomy. Though the current warfare isn't very intense, Ars is convinced there will be more severe conflict down the road, since his father is already forced to fight in the current conflict. Ars decides to use his ability to gather promising talents and prepare them for battle, even though he hopes that war doesn't break out in the future. Ars wonders where war will break out in the future, and Ritsu tells him it will probably start from the Mission region. He informs Ars that the Duke of the Duchy of Mission is very old and likely to meet his maker very soon. The Duke has two sons, and though the eldest is supposed to succeed him when this happens the younger son seems more capable. The Duke was worried about who to pick as his successor in the case of his demise. Ritsu is sure that war will break out, if the Duke gives up the ghost before he decides his successor war will break out. He's also sure war will break out regardless, even if the Duke decides because both sons are power hungry. Ars can't believe his ears and he wonders who his father will side with if such an occurrence takes place. Ritsu informs him that his father will likely side with the eldest son, but he knows it's not his father who will make the choice. Ars realizes his father isn't a direct vassal to the Duke of the Duchy of Mission because he's a vassal of the Kanar Head, which is where Lambert falls in. Ars realizes his appraisal ability could be useful in deciding who to side with if a war breaks out. Ars was worried because though his father is still alive, he was only a kid and since he has only been able to scout Ritsu, he didn't want his father to fall in the minority. Ritsu tells Ars a lord can advance and rank if they play a big part in an active war. Ritsu sees that as a reason for them to continue doing their best to increase their strength, and he reassures Ars that he'll always be around to protect them. Ritsu realizes they need to scout for capable people and he asks for Ars' assistance. Ars agrees to help him search for talented people and Ritsu promises to accompany him. Ars and Ritsu walk out of the family house and Ars is surprised to see his father out practicing. 
he noticed that his father has been practicing swordsmanship lately, and he wonders if his father is aware that a war is about to break out. Lord Raven notices Ars and he wonders if Ars is going into town. Ars informs him that he's going to look for outstanding talent, and his father advises him to look out for someone good with magic. Ars is surprised by this, but Lord Raven tells him magic will be useful in the upcoming war. Lord Raven isn't very good at magic, and he is aware that many vassals possess magic, but they're not very good at it. Ritsu realizes that there could come a time when such a mage could change the tide of war. Ars remembers a time when he cast magic because his father asked him to. Then he wore a strange tool with a ball of red liquid and he recited a short incantation, but his magic was a sight for sore eyes. After that, his father never allowed him to cast magic again and Ars made peace with the fact that he has no magic talent. Lord Raven tells he's counting on him to find a person with magic talent and Ars promises to do his best. They take a horse to go into town and Ritsu is convinced their strength will increase greatly if they can find someone with enough magic talent to be useful in battle. Ars decides to look for someone with such talent for the sake of the future of his home. They arrive at the fortified city in Kanar and Ars is surprised by the number of people on the street. Ritsu informs him that the city is home to 50,000 people and Ars is shocked because that's five times the people in Lambert. He points out the Kanar castle and he tells Ars the castle is home to the Pyre's family, which is the county chief's family. Ars notices a lot of wealthy people on the streets and he hopes the people of Lambert can one day live like that. Ars decides to use his appraisal skill and he looks around trying to find someone with outstanding talent. After a while, Ars and Ritsu sit at a fountain and Ars is bummed out because he couldn't find anyone with outstanding talent. A person's ability values are divided into numbers and competency, so no matter the number of value without competency a person cannot perform well. Ritsu reassures him that they still have time to find someone with talent, since they just begun their search. While Ritsu is following the city map, Ars stops by an alleyway with beggars. Ritsu is telling him about a landmark, but he notices Ars is looking at something else. He approaches Ars and he looks into the alleyway. He informs Ars that there will always be beggars as long as there are rich people. Ritsu acknowledged that saying such a thing is wrong, since Ars saved him from such a life, but he tells Ars they can't do anything for the people. Ars agrees with Ritsu but he tells Ritsu his perspective of the city has changed after seeing people living in such conditions. He tells Ritsu he wants to make a society where there's no discrimination between the rich and the poor, though he admits the naivety and his ambitions, he tells Ritsu he believes there's talent in everyone. Ritsu admits that he's proud to serve Ars, which makes Ars very surprised. A strange character who was spying on them walks away. They arrive at the largest market Kanar and Ars is surprised by how much food he can set his eyes on. A trader tries to convince him to buy a dragon egg so he can have it as a pet. Ars is surprised that dragon exist and he's even more baffled that they can be domesticated. Ars is taken in by the trader's bargains and the trader tells him the rare eggs are worth one silver coin each, like someone under Genjutsu. Ars tells the trader to give him three dragon eggs and he rummages through his bag for money. Ritsu isn't fooled by the trader and he wonders why the trader sells fakes to people. He interrogates the trader with a sword and the trader tries to feign innocence, but Ritsu is having none of that. Ritsu knew the city was no longer in trade with the continent where eggs could be found. He tells the trader the eggs are genuine because the dimensions and color are not the same as the ones he read about in books. He's convinced that the eggs are lizard eggs that the trader made out to be dragon eggs, but the trader denies it. Ritsu is about to take the life of the trader for trying to fool Ars, and the trader begins saying his last prayers. Ars intervenes and begs Raids to spare the trader because he is not buying the eggs anymore, Ritsu apologizes for acting without caution but Ars thanks him for saving him from being scanned. He wonders if the other trader will fool him just like the egg trader. He decides to become more knowledgeable so Ritsu doesn't end up ending someone's life. They decide to keep looking for talent, but they take a lunch break after a while. Ritsu cautions Ars to eat slowly as he hands him a steak but he suddenly notices a stall selling candy. He rushes over with some money and he asks the vendor to give him some but someone bumps into him and relieves him of the weight of his pouch of money. Ars doesn't notice this and he thinks the person bumped into him by accident because he appeared to be in a hurry. Ritsu informs him that his pouch has been stolen and he assures him he will catch the thief. He carries Ars on his back and he begins chasing after the thief. The thief was the strange person who was spying on them earlier. Ritsu gets close to the thief and takes off her disguise. The girl runs into an alleyway and Ritsu follows him into the alleyway. The thief is suddenly surrounded by bandits and the boss beats the little thief for trying to run away. Ars tries to intervene and stop the man from hitting the girl, but the boss is pissed off by his presence. 
He tries to attack Ars, but Ritza blocks his attack and counters attacks him. He takes down the boss and the henchmen decide to attack Ritsu. Ritsu takes them down one after the other and they turn tail and flee. Ars wonders if the girl is alright and he uses his appraisal ability on her. He discovers that she has an S-tier mage ability and a very high prowess. He sees that the girl is named Charlotte and he's surprised by her abilities despite her young age. Ars realizes that her magical power is off the charts though she's not very skilled in other combat forms. Ritsu approaches Charlotte and tells her to return Ars's pouch, but Ars asks her to become his vassal. Ritsu is shocked by this because he thinks she's just a common thief, but Ars informs him that her magic talent is phenomenal. Charlotte refuses his offer because she doesn't want to work for a kid of his status and Ars is shocked. He tries to convince her to lend him her powers, but she tells him she's never used magic before. Ars tells her he can see she has an impressive magic ability, and he also realizes that she steals because she has a difficult life. He tells her she could live a better life if she becomes his vassal, and she tells him that's an opinion from a nobleman's standpoint. She wonders why the nobles always look down on people like her. She tells Ars she won't be a tool to protect his luxurious life, but Ars tries to convince her that he's not like other nobles. He tells her his dream is to make a city where people can live with peace of mind and without fear of discrimination. Charlotte tells him she can't wait for him to create such a utopia if he isn't sure of the day. She thinks he's trying to hire her just to make himself look good, so she refuses his offer once again. Ritza tells her to return the pouch she stole, and she cooperates because she doesn't want to remain in their debt since they saved her. Ars wonders who the men were and Charlotte tells him they are henchmen of some slave merchants she escaped from. Ars tries to convince her to run farther away but she tells him she can't and Ars wonders why. Suddenly several children come running to welcome Charlotte, Ritsu wonders who the kids are and Charlotte tells them they are orphans living in the alleyway just like her. She tells them she can't just leave the kids like that, so Ars decides to give her his pouch. Later in the day Ars sits on a bench outside his room, Ritsu tries to convince him to come into the room because it's cold outside but Ars doesn't move. Ritsu tells Ars he can empathize with Charlotte because he was once like her. He informs Ars that Charlotte has probably suffered at the hands of nobles, and that's why she thinks that all nobles are the same. He reassures Ars that he's different but Ars tells him he took his privilege for granted. Ars tells Ritsu Charlotte was right about him, suddenly he sees the orphans running through the streets and calling out to Charlotte. Ars goes out to meet them and they inform him that Charlotte was caught. The story continues, we see the thugs throw Charlotte on the ground at their base and they beat her up for making their jobs a lot harder. They keep beating her, but Charlotte has since lost her feeling, which pisses off the thugs because she doesn't cry or call out to anyone for help. The leader of the thugs warns his underlings to lay off beating Charlotte because she already has a buyer and he doesn't want to taint her face. He informs them that he doesn't want to get on his customer's bad side and the thugs agree to stop beating Charlotte. They suddenly notice a pouch next to Charlotte and they think it's one of the pouches she stole from people on the streets. They pick up the pouch and they notice it contains a lot of money, but Charlotte takes the pouch back and tries to run away. The thugs catch up to her and suppress her, trying to prove that she won't be getting away from them. Charlotte remembers the faces of the children in her care and all the things the money in the pouch can do for them. The thug leader informs her that there's no use running because all that awaits her is a life of misery. He tries to convince her to accept her new reality and put all the blame on her parents who abandoned her, but someone suddenly takes down the thug guarding the door. The door breaks in and the thugs wonder who's interfering with their business. Ritsu walks into the room and the thug recognizes him from their fight in the alley. The things tried to take Ritsu down, but he takes down whoever rushes at him. The thug leader decides to stop the remaining thugs to stop engaging Ritsu and Ars rushes in wondering if Charlotte is okay. She wonders what he's doing at the thug's base and the thug leader can't believe Ars is so confident that he can get away scot-free after breaking down his door. Ars uses his appraiser ability to reveal the thug leader's name as Albert and he wonders if he's a slave trader. Albert is surprised that Ars has recognized him and he figures out that Ars is a noble. Ars orders him to release Charlotte, but Albert informs him that he can't because Charlotte is merchandise to him. He tries to make Ars understand because he thinks he's like the other nobles who buy slaves from him. Ars approaches him and tells him he's not like other nobles. Charlotte asks him to back down, wondering why he's standing up for her, though he hardly knows her. Ars suddenly asks her why her eyes look so empty, because it's been on his mind ever since he met her. Ars uses his appraisal ability on her and he notices that her ambition score is 1. Albert wonders what Ars is talking about and Ars is explains to him that someone's ambition is the person's hopes for themselves. It represents a desire to improve and hope for the future. 
Ours explains that Charlotte has given up on her future and that's why her ambition score is just one. Ours wonders if Albert can imagine anyone sadder than someone who's lost all hope for their future. Albert laughs it off because he knows that Charlotte is a slave and slaves don't have a future. Ours wondered why Albert is laughing when he's supposed to be an adult that protects children's future, but he chose to steal Charlotte's own away from her. He's pissed that Albert still dares to laugh about that because they've taken away Charlotte's ability to decide her future. Charlotte remembers when she sat depressingly in an alleyway, trying to remember the last time she shed tears. She realized that crying doesn't help her solve anything, nor does it improve her probability of survival. Charlotte gave up on her dreams after she realized that people's destinies are determined the moment they are born. Charlotte closed her heart to the world to prevent them from hurting her with their glaring stares and their condescending looks. Charlotte resorted to stealing after realizing that crying is for the weak and that will leave her vulnerable to the world. She decided to focus solely on survival and do her best to do strong so she never had to cry. Charlotte now wonders why her eyes are letting down streams of tears after she vowed never to shed a single tear again. One of the thugs didn't like the tone ours was using for Albert, and Albert decides to call down more of his underlings. He admits that he gave ours some leniency because he's a noble, but now he's had enough of his insurance. Charlotte tells ours to run to safety, but ours assures her that he'll take care of everything and she'll be okay soon. Ours tells Ritsu to dispose of the thugs, but the thugs hardly give him time to finish his sentence before they rush at him. Ritsu makes quick work of the first thug, asking them if they know the grave offense they've committed. He informs them that the payment for angering ours is their lives, but they decide to surround him and take him down at once. Once he's only one person, they all rush at him one by one but he takes them down successively. Albert signals to his mages to take down Ritsu but he nullifies their magic with his sword and defeats them. Albert is now at a loss of words after realizing that Ritsu is a monster. Charlotte is surprised by how strong Ritsu is, that she has some confidence that they could. Ritsu wonders if Albert is done or if he still has more men to sacrifice for his ego. Albert calls down his secret weapon from upstairs and the huge thug comes down the stairs, wondering why everyone is so noisy. Albert informs them that the huge thug was once a captain in the Kanar army, but he was kicked out for bad behavior. Charlotte is surprised by how huge the thug is, and she informs Ars that they can't take him down. Ars uses his appraisal ability on the thug and he tells Charlotte to rest easy after going through the thug's features. The huge thug is surprised that the other thugs lost to someone as puny as Ritsu, but Ritsu tells him he can only make fun of them if he succeeds in taking him down. The huge thug promises to take the weight of his head off his body, and he tries to grab at Ritsu but he only grabs air. He wonders if Ritsu disappeared into thin air, but Ritsu is hanging on a chandelier and he mocks him for being so slow. Ritsu makes the thug eat his boot and when he recovers he makes him see butterflies with a strong punch to his jaw, which takes him out. Charlotte wonders how Ritsu is so strong while Albert mourns his fallen soldiers. Albert warns that Arza's actions will anger the headman of the Kanar district because he approves of slave trading. Ars is aware of that, so he decides to pay for the purchase of Charlotte. Albert is adamant about taking the money, but Ritsu reminds him that the slave trade is built on trust. Albert wonders what Ritsu is getting at, and Ritsu informs him that if they take Charlotte away without paying, it would ruin his reputation. He suggests that he informs his buyer that someone came up to him with a better piece so they don't have to resort to unethical measures to ensure Charlotte's safety. Albert gives in telling Ritsu to take her, and Ritsu is so glad that Albert is cooperating that they decide to throw him some extra to cover for his troubles. Ars is appreciates Ritsu for his effort because things worked out just the way he said they would. Ritsu informs Ars that he's honored as always to be in his service, they both walk over the Charlotte and Ars offers her his hand to help her up so she can go back to her friends who are waiting for her. Charlotte reluctantly agrees, but when they come out of the thug's base, Charlotte informs them that there's somewhere she would like to go before they return home. Charlotte leads them through a thick forest which tires our Ars who can't wait till they get to their destination. Charlotte is amused by how vulnerable Ars looks, but after a short distance she announces that they have arrived at their destination. Ars looks up to see a beautiful view of the town from a rock, and Charlotte informs him that that's her secret spot. Whenever she takes in the view from the spot, all the problems that the town presents fade into oblivion. She always goes to the spot to take in the view from time to time just to keep her sanity because she likes the place. Ars wonders why she would share her special spot with him, and Charlotte reminds him about his dream to build a town where underprivileged people are treated just like nobles. 
She wonders why he has such a dream and he tells her it's because he likes children, a statement that would land him in jail if he was in his previous life. Charlotte wonders why he's saying that even when he's a child and Ars remembers images from his last life. He informs her that a child's smile can lift one's spirits when they're down because a child's smile is so full of hope, they both take in the view from Charlotte's special spot one last time. The next day, Ritsu and Ars are hanging out with the children as they play around, the orphans talk about their dreams for their future, and Ars is pleased that the children have hope for what the future may bring. Ars is convinced that happiness holds great power and the children's smiles can also influence the adults to get excited for the future and try to live a better life. Ars is convinced because that kind of enthusiasm can make a city a better place. R stares into the distant horizon, hopeful that he can build a place where children will always have hope. He informs Charlotte that such a responsibility can only fall on the shoulders of the leader of the city, that's why he wants to build a town where people like her can live stable lives. R suddenly realizes that he sounds like he's lecturing her and he apologizes for this, he admits that he was caught up in the moment because he's so passionate about his dreams. To his surprise, Charlotte agrees to go with him and become his retainer. Ars wonders if Charlotte won't worry about the children, but she informs him that the children are the reason she's going with him. She informs him that she wants them to have a future similar to the one he's describing, and Ritsu decides to confirm her magic ability using a magic item. Ars wonders where he got the item from and he informs Ars that he borrowed it from a house they visited. Ritsu hands Charlotte the magic item so she can test her magic because he wants to see her magic ability for himself so he can fully take her as a comrade. Charlotte confesses that it's her first time using magic and she doesn't even know how to cast spells. Ritsu decides to show her how to cast a spell while Ars looks on with anticipation, wondering what someone with an S-rank aptitude is capable of. Ritsu informs him that she's ready, and she says the incantation that Ritsu told her, a huge fireball suddenly manifests in her outstretched palm and a flame bursts into the air. To the surprise of Ritsu and Ars, people in the town are also surprised by the spell. The magic item breaks from the magic overload, and Charlotte is happy with the power of her spouse. Ars is amazed by Charlotte's power while Ritsu is so dazed by her magic that he barely manages to squeeze out a compliment from his mouth. Charlotte wonders if she'll get food and a place to live once she becomes Ars's retainer. He informs her she'll get all that, including a monthly salary but she asks him to send her salary to the children because they'll have a hard time getting along without her. She informs him that all she needs is food and a place to live and Ars promises to give her salary to the orphanage. Ars informs her that he's enthusiastic about her future. Charlotte prostrates and promises to do all she can to make his dream come true. Ars tells her she doesn't have to be so formal, and she decides to do away with it because she's not very good with fancy talk. Ars informs her that they need to head back home since they've gotten what they want and they're running out of money. Charlotte immediately apologizes for stealing their money, and she thanks them for saving her from the thugs. Ars tells her not to worry about it, but Charlotte didn't imagine she would one day be a retainer to someone younger than her. She tells Ritsu she's more interested in Ars's future, and Ritsu agrees with her. The next day, Charlotte goes to say goodbye to the orphans, and Ars is glad that he now has another dependable companion. Though he was glad that his house was now stronger, he was also feeling the pressure of having amazing people around him while being completely normal. Ars decides to stick to his dream and try his best to achieve it. On their way back, they stop to take some snacks, but Ritsu notices that Charlotte has bad table manners. He informs her she'll have to learn it if she wants to remain as Ars is retainer, but she tells him it's impossible. They arrive home, but Lord Raven refuses to acknowledge Charlotte as Ars's retainer because the battlefield isn't fit for a woman. Ars asks Charlotte to demonstrate her power to Lord Raven and after seeing the result, he immediately accepts her into House Luvent. The story continues. We see three years later, Ars welcomes his father back home and explains that their domain lies in the Kanar district, and because of it, they've been dealing with land disputes with the neighboring province. Therefore, his father has been dispatched there several times to solve the conflict. Despite losing some men, everyone's spirits are still high. Ars runs to his father and asks how the battle went, his father explains it was pretty easy to win, especially because Charlotte had the chance to use her magic. He welcomes her and explains that due to her insane magic talent, Charlotte was able to quickly get famous and became one of the most feared mages. She even received the title of Lovent's Lady of Flames and became the pride of his house's mage corps. Ars couldn't even believe that one person talented could make a huge change, but now he realizes how important a skill can be. Suddenly, his mother appears and Ars reveals there's one last news from the past three years. He now has a little brother and sister, twins. 
His father checks on his siblings, noticing how they change every time he gets dispatched. His mother confirms but claims they all look like ours, which is quite sus. Ars checks his sibling stats and notices how important they will become in the future. Suddenly Ritsu arrives, claiming they could have found more talented people. A family of hunters have moved into their land and the older brothers are getting praised by their skills. Ars decides to check it out the next day and prepares to leave with Ritsu on a horse. Ritsu explains the family lives in the woods, but Charlotte wants to know what he will do. Ars explains and she decides to join them as Ars escort because it's her off-duty day. Ars is having the comfiest horse ride, but Charlotte thinks this is taking too much time. Ritsu explains it's her fault because she can't ride and they're forced to ride the same horse. Charlotte complains mentioning that she and Ars are light and that Ritsu should get off and run, he refuses to because she's the one who insisted in coming with them. She claims that she wants to escort Ars, but Ritsu insists that he's capable of doing anything by himself. They continue to argue with Charlotte mentioning that she is the one who can protect Ars because of her real battle accomplishments. However, Ars notices that he's breaking up his comrades while looking for new ones. As they continue, they see a boar passing by but gets shot down by an arrow. They're impressed by what they just watched and notice the two mentioned siblings. The siblings compliment each other while calling out their competition, Ritsu explains they must be the ones they're looking for. Upon noticing the group, the siblings apologize because they didn't notice them, and Ars uses his skill to check their stats, they Gatus and Marcus, and realize they're the ones they're looking for. Their prowess is around mid-60s, with Gatus having an A-ranked aptitude for infantry, while Marcus has an A-rank for archery. The siblings ask what they're doing there, and Ars tells them that he's here to request something. They take the group to their house and their father gives them a huge meal. The old man apologizes because it isn't much, but Charlotte starts digging in right away. She asks about what kind of meat is that, and Gatus explains it's the boar they caught earlier. He explains they're difficult to catch because they're small and fast, but they're delicious. Ritsu, however, tells her to show some restraint because she's acting as an escort. The sibling's father then asks what Ars wants with them, Ars is direct and mentions he wants Gatus and Marcus to serve as soldiers for his family. Their father gets excited about it and Ars mentions he could tell they're talented. Ritsu adds that Ars is capable of noticing someone's talent which increases the family happiness. The father mentions how they now can fulfill their dreams to become soldiers. The siblings promise to do their best and he mentions how Ars is a lot more mature than his youngest son Roselle, who is a similar age. Ars becomes curious and explains that his younger son is quite inept. At the same time, the same kid sneakily enters the room and takes a loaf of bread. Ars asks where Roselle is, and Charlotte asks if that's him. They all notice him, and the father tells him to stop sneaking without greeting the son's lord. The kid turns around and is clearly too shy to greet someone properly. Ritsu notices how his hair is different compared to his brother's. Suddenly R's ability activates and he notices the small kids has huge potential, not only his ingenuity can reach 109, but he also has several ranked skills plus an S rank strategist. R's can't even believe this ingenuity and thinks it's like a famous general who was reborn. He thinks Roselle is a monster and doubts that he will be able to find a higher stat in the whole empire. He knows that his stats are low because Roselle is only 5 but with proper training, he will become a brilliant retainer in the future. The father turns around and apologizes because Roselle is inept when compared to his brothers. However, Ars mentions right away that he also wants Roselle as his retainer. The family can't believe and the father tries to stop it by mentioning that Roselle will bring trouble. Ars rejects it and personally invites Roselle to join him. Roselle questions himself but Ars is explains he knows that he has talent and asks to join. However, Roselle starts tearing down because he thinks they're just forcing him to fight in the future. He imagines Ars, Ritsu and Charlotte's scary faces ready to exploit him. Without a second thought, Roselle refuses to because he knows that he will die and runs away. Ars cannot believe he got rejected, but Ritsu mentions he saw this before while looking at Charlotte. The father apologizes and mentions that Roselle probably won't agree because he's frail and timid when compared to his brothers. He explains that his mother passed away two years ago and since then Roselle has been isolating himself from everyone. Usually the son of a hunter would be chopping wood and training with a bow by the age of five. However, due to his lacks of skills, he would probably struggle to survive, much less go to war. Yet, Ars tells him that Roselle's talent isn't meant to be a soldier like his brother's because his talents would make him a great strategist. The father is confused but realizes that his son is clever and well-spoken. Ars believes that Roselle's intelligence will help them a lot and decides to get inside and ask him again. Upon getting inside, 
Roselle grabs his book and crawls against the wall, Ars apologizes for startling him and tries to apologize. He asks if Roselle likes books who confirms that, he mentions that he only has that book but his mother used to read it to him all the time. Ars feels bad about it and Roselle explains that when he's reading, he can forget that he's bad at everything else. Despite feeling bad, Ars approaches him and asks if Roselle wants to visit his family's library. He confirms that they have several books and Roselle can take anything he wants. Roselle, however, tries to refuse because he thinks Ars will guilt trip them to force him to anything he wants. Ars says no because he thought that Roselle could enjoy reading different books. Since there is no catch, Roselle agrees on the condition that his brothers go with him, Ars agrees and takes the siblings to his house. Upon getting there, Roselle gets scared because a dog licks his face, but he thinks it's a ferocious beast who's going to eat him. Charlotte is tasked to show the older siblings around and introduces her as the captain of the Mage Corps. She's annoyed to do something, but changes her mind when they praise her. Ars then uses this chance to bring Roselle to the library while revealing they have a copy of every book in the Empire, Roselle cannot close his mouth and starts looking at the bookshelves. Ars tells him to feel comfortable and reveals that he will leave for a bit because he still has his daily lessons, but turns out that Ars fell asleep after his classes and panics because he thinks that Roselle has left. He runs back to the library and notices Ritsu taking care of Roselle. Ritsu explains that Roselle was too excited and decided to read as much as possible, but in the end he got tired and fell asleep. Ritsu also reveals that he taught Roselle some words he didn't know and he was quickly able to understand what they mean. R's ability activates and cannot believe that Roselle's ingenuity stat rise up by several points within hours. His siblings arrive to take him back home and are confused on how he can enjoy books if he can't even read. Ars is shocked, but they explain that hunters don't need reading skills. Roselle wakes up and Ars asks him how he learned to read. He explains that he remembers his mother reading to him when he was little, so he tried to match what she was saying to the words on the page until he was able to read it. Gatus is confused because Roselle was three at the time, but the young kid explains that he remembers everything since he was born. This shocks everyone, especially Ars who realizes that Roselle is so talented to the point where he learned to read on his own. He cannot let such talent to go waste but there's a problem, his family. Ritsu proposes that they could let everyone know there's ways to hunt without a bow, which will also give Roselle some confidence. Therefore, Ars visits the hunter family the next day and tells the siblings to use traps instead of bows. They all get confused but he explains that it's popular in other continents. Gatus doesn't think it will work because sewer are fast and smart animals and it shouldn't be possible. Ars, however, counters and holds Roselle's hands while mentioning that his real strength is his brain, and if he uses his brain, he will be able to create a trap that will force his father to acknowledge him. Roselle doesn't believe in himself, but his brothers cheer him up by telling they will help him. He decides to try it and after some days his father is shocked by a strange structure. His sons tell him to look inside and he cannot believe the amount of sewer inside. They explain that Roselle made the trap and pushed him forward. The kid explains that he knew his father had to do all the hunting if his brothers became soldiers. Therefore, he read about the sewer's behavior and made a trap based on it. The siblings also points to some herbs hanging on some tree, and Roselle explains that baby sewers and nursing mothers hate the smell of it. Therefore, babies and mothers will stay away from the trap this way, preserving the balance with nature, just like his father wants. Upon looking around again, the father turns cold and tells his older sons leave the house and take Roselle with them, he then asks Ars to take care of Roselle. The old man walks away, which makes Roselle feel like he's being hated on. Roselle tries to walk away because he was told to leave, but Ars tells him to return back home because his father must have his reasons. That night, Roselle tells himself that his father hates him because his mother got sick after he was born. Later on she died and he believes that his family hates him and blames him for her death. That was the reason why he shut himself up on his room, he wishes he wasn't born and starts to try. Suddenly he hears some noise outside, his siblings and father get to the roof and the brothers try to avoid making noise while thanking his father for raising them. They all share a drink, while his father tells him to thank their mother for it. Gatus then asks why his father was so cold when he spoke to Roselle, despite his efforts to impress him. Yet. The father simply tells the older brothers that Roselle should hate him. He explains that he was too harsh on Roselle and failed to notice his talent because he was focused on what he couldn't do. He thinks of himself as a failure of a father for not seeing his potential. Therefore he wants Roselle to spend his life in a place where he can shine. The problem is that Roselle is kind like his mother and cares about their family. 
Therefore the father decided to make Roselle hate and resent him, forcing him to leave. The father starts to cry and begs his sons to support Roselle and not fail like he did, Roselle is listening to their conversation and cries. The next day, Ars and Ritza come to pick up everyone and Rosal ignores his father, deciding to leave without saying goodbye. His father is sad but decides to focus on cutting some wood. Roselle, however, gets closer and reveals that he could never hate his father. He confirms that he was useless at home, but he will learn under Ars and become a lot useful in the future. He starts crying and asks if they can live together again when that day comes, his father turns around crying and tells his youngest son that he will wait for him. The older siblings turn to Ars and thank him for taking their whole family as retainers. Ars, however, reveals that he only cares about the people who live on his domain and is happy to see their family bond restored. The three siblings then pledge loyalty and promise to become useful in the future. The story continues, we see Ars suggest to Lord Raven that he should lead the next engagement, since he has taken ill, but his father declined his offer. Ars presses on because he knows his father shouldn't be fighting in such a condition, but Lord Raven tells him he has no choice given the state of things. Ars recollects how the governor of Mission passed away a year ago due to illness, and he named his younger son as his successor. The elder brother insisted that the younger brother forge the document, but the younger son had been making a name for himself in battle. This made few retainers begin to believe he should inherit the throne in his brother's place according to their customs. This tour, the region of Mission into two factions with one part supporting the elder brother, while the other factions supported the younger brother. Saints, a neighboring province, took advantage of this division to press on the offensive, which made Ars realize he needs to take to the battlefield after all. An entourage is heading towards Lamberg and the carriage driver informs his passenger that they'll soon be arriving at their destination. He informs her that they may be delayed because of the rain, but she tells him the rain is a sign that the heavens are smiling upon them. Lord Raven informs Ars that there's something else he should direct his brain power to. Ars looks up at Lord Raven with surprise over his face, and Lord Raven wonders why he's surprised. He reminds him about the betrothal and Ars wonders when and why a betrothal was arranged behind his back. Lord Raven tells him he can't remember, and he's surprised that he didn't inform Ars. He shows Ars the letter, which arrived a few days ago, and Ars just stares at it totally baffled. Ars rushes to his room and he announces the bad news that his letter of betrothal has arrived. While everyone is surprised to hear this, Charlotte is disappointed that Ars isn't going to be spending the rest of his life with her. Ars tells her to cut out the joke because it's not the time for it, since he's just heard about the betrothal for the first time. A maid suddenly enters the room to inform him that someone claiming to be his fiancé has arrived to visit him, Ars' spirit almost leaves his body, but he calms himself and he goes outside to receive his visitor. He arrives outside as she steps out of her carriage, and he wonders what he should do now that she's around, because he didn't even have a girlfriend in his previous life. He keeps wondering what his fiancé will look like and how she'll act when she comes up to him. His fiancé arrives and she informs him that she's delighted to meet him as she introduces herself as Ligia Plaid. Ars can hardly speak as he pawns over her beauty, and while he's thanking his lucky stars, he uses his appraisal skill and he notices that she has a diplomacy score of 100 and an ambition of 80. She suddenly looks so terrifying to Ars because he wonders why such a timid and gentle person will have such a high ambition. Ars's gears suddenly begin to turn and he thinks Ligia is just putting on an act to try to get on his good side. The thought of her deposing him from the throne crosses his mind, and he realizes that he's the only one who can forward her evil plans with his father indisposed. He promises not to let her fool and Ligia wonders if there's something on her face, since Ars has just been staring at her without saying a word. Her chaperone informs her that Ars is just dumbfounded by her beauty, which makes her blush. Ars can't believe how cute she looks when she blushes, he immediately forgets his promise to stop her evil plans, and he welcomes her and so he can show her around the estate. They enter the estate while everyone is running around, putting things together when Jean, Ligia's chaperone notices that Ritsu is the Malkan. Ligia is surprised that he doesn't know about Ritsu's exploits on the battlefield, and she tells him not to speak ill about him. She tells him to apologize, and he immediately asks for forgiveness from Ars, but Ars tells him not to worry about it. Ars is surprised that Ligia put Jean in order so quickly, and he begins to have a change of heart towards her. The maids welcome them to the estate with some roses and Ligia is endeared by their gesture towards her. She commends their hard work in putting the place in order, and she also commends the meal they served during dinner. Ars is explaining how they made the meal, but Ligia notices he has some sauce on his face and she points this out. 
Ars quickly cleans it off, but he's impressed that Ligia can carry their conversation even when he has zero conversational skills. Ars realizes that he would have been head over heels for Ligia if didn't have his appraisal skills after he goes over her qualities in his head. Ligia informs Ars that she passed through Lamberg on their way there, and she tells the place is wonderful. Ars tells her he would show her around himself if not for the bad weather, and she tells him he'll have the chance to do so, the clouds suddenly clear and Ars wonders if Ligia can control the weather. She tells him she was just watching the clouds from her carriage so she could tell it was passing weather. She asks Ars to show her around while Charlotte and Roselle are peeping at them through a door, Charlotte asks Roselle what he thinks about Ligia, and he tells her she seems nice, but he's scared of her. Charlotte confesses that she feels the same because Ligia seems very dangerous. Ars and Ligia go for a walk, and some citizens recognize Ars, but they don't recognize Ligia. Ars introduces her to them as his betrothed and they suggest he should throw a party to celebrate it. Ars knows that he can't tell them that Ligia could be a threat to their domain. He hears an argument and he rushes to the scene where a witness informs him that two merchants are arguing over a Magistone order. Ars decides to step in without fail because Ligia will see his incompetence if he fails, Charlotte suddenly comes out of nowhere and she suggests she can end everything with just one hit of her magic, but Ligia stops her. Ligia recognizes her as the famous mage, and she asks for a handshake because she's a fan of Charlotte, Charlotte has no choice but to take a hand, but she notices that Roselle looks disappointed in her. Ligia suggests that she settles the argument, and she asks Ars for a favor if she succeeds, while the men are engaged in a scuffle, she approaches them and tells them such rage can ruin their handsome faces. The men wonder who she is, and she introduces herself as Ars is betrothed. The men are happy that Ars was able to get such a beautiful young lady as is betrothed, she informs the merchant that she would buy the sound magistone, which was wrongly bought by the supplier, since they can't mine the stones in her country. She offers to exchange the stones for a good price, and she offers the merchant the flame magistone excess they mine from a volcano in her country at a reasonable price. She tells them it was ours who came up with the idea, which makes the people glad that he's interested in settling petty disputes. He suggests they write up a contract in future to prevent such disputes, and after the crowd dissipates ours thanks Ligia for her brilliant idea. Ligia is just glad that everyone is now settled, but Ars is convinced her level of diplomacy is next level. Later in the day after their outing, Ars apologizes for making Ligia walk so much, but she tells him it was worth it because she gained a lot of knowledge. Charlotte suddenly comes in to tell her that she's not accepted, even if she can settle the disputes with the merchants, she is still angry with the whole betrothed business, and she tells Ligia not to feel too important. Ligia decides to cash in her favor, she tells him she wants to ask him a question and she pleads with him to answer honestly. She asks him what kind of person he likes, and Ars wonders what kind of question she's asking because he doesn't know what her endgame is. He thinks about avoiding the question wittily, but he realizes that he can't outsmart Ligia, so he decides to answer honestly. He tells her he likes people who speak their minds and hide nothing from him, and she promises to keep that in mind. They eat an extravagant meal for dinner, which was prepared by Ritsu, while Charlotte puts on a magic display which everyone enjoys. Ars was disappointed that he didn't find out what Ligia was up to, so he decided to pick up from where he stopped the next day, since she was staying the night. He is about to sleep when he raises his bed sheet to see Ligia hiding underneath, he tries to scream out but she shushes him. Ars wonders if she's lost, but she informs him that someone showed her his room, so she slipped out of her to come to his because she wanted to see the surprise on his face when he saw her in his bed. She informs him she wants to have a conversation with him and he pours her some tea. He asks her what she wants to talk about, and she asks him what he thinks about her. Ars is surprised by this question, and she confesses that she can tell someone's feelings even when they try to hide it. She informs Ars that the feeling he had when he first saw her was suspicion, she was fine by this since they just met, but she was surprised that his suspicion grew the longer she conversed with him, which was a weird occurrence. She wondered why he didn't trust her so much to the point that he asked her to tell him her true feelings. Ars is impressed by her observational skills, and he realizes he's made her uneasy for a while, so he decides to answer honestly. He informs her about his appraisal skill, and he tells her she has a higher diplomacy and ambition stat than most people, this made him think she had an ulterior motive because her actions were so calculated. Ars doesn't think Ligia would believe him, but she tells him she believes him because that explains his behavior towards her. She admits that she has a high ambition and Ars wonders what she's aiming for, but she tells him she just wants an amazing man to fall in love with her at first sight. 
Ars realizes that she had the right ambition since she's a lord's daughter, and he thinks it's less than ideal for her to be betrothed to someone like him, who's in charge of a small domain. Ligia confesses that she can tell what Ars is thinking, and she tells him that she would have broken their engagement if he turned out to be an oath, but she informs him that spending time with him changed her mind and she would be willing to marry him. Ars reiterates that he's a lord of a small domain, and she tells him there's a possibility that his domain can be expanded. Ars tells her that he is just surrounded by people who make his work easier, and she tells him she noticed that he was loved because of how endearing the people were towards her when she introduced herself as his betrothed. She informs him she has come to love him, just like his people love him, and she tells him goodnight as she returns in her room. Ars begins to have a meltdown with the way he responded to Ligia, he's surprised that her ambition was so charming, but he's pleased that she spoke her mind without questioning his skill. Meanwhile, Ligia is disappointed in her lack of etiquette for sneaking into a gentleman's room and then fleeing in embarrassment, but she was glad she was able to tell someone how she truly felt for the first time in her life. The next day, Ligia pondered on the fact that people don't consider others while they struggle to seize power. She wasn't happy that she could sense other people's sentiments until the day she learned that she could escape such an evil world if she married a man with political ability. From that day, she began to appreciate her ability while saying things she didn't mean, initially she didn't plan to marry into House Luvent because she wanted a stronger house. She only wanted to make a good impression and form a favorable bond, but she ended up making Ars suspicious of her. She was surprised that he only grew suspicious of her, no matter how many times she flashed her hypnotic smile, and all this while, she couldn't tell what he was thinking. This was until he got her a soul for any blisters she ended up having because she walked so much that day, she realized that he was kind regardless of a person's rank, because of how he treated citizens like his own family members. Ligia longed to be part of such a world where everyone treated each other like family. She was enchanted by ours because he accepted her after she told him who she was. She was grateful to God for giving her such an ability. She knew that someone would try to hurt ours because he was so kind. So she decided to remain by his side so no one would be able to get to him. After Ligia left, she began exchanging letters with Ars, who was always nervous to write to her. The war in the region lulled and Lord Raven recovered a little from his illness, which made Ars happy. The story continues, we see Ars was now also convinced that he wanted to marry Ligia, and he hoped life remained peaceful like this forever. Ars is informed by the family doctor that his father's condition has worsened and he's advised to prepare for the worst outcome. Ars realizes he's not been able to pay his father back for all he's done, so he says, a silent prayer to heaven to spare his father's life and give him more time. Meanwhile, in the Arcantes castle, an assassin walks into the Duke of Duchy of Mission's throne room, when the Duke realizes he's in trouble, he tries to flee, but the assassin gets him from behind. The soldiers of the castle chase after the assassin and surround him before he's able to flee, but he jumps through the glass window, taking his own life. The soldiers are disappointed that they don't get to punish the assassin for his terrible act. Lord Raven is informed of this incident and he passes the news on to Ars and his companions. He asks Roselle what he thinks the incident will lead to, and he tells him the most probable outcome will be a break out of war around the province. Lord Raven shares the same thought process with her because he thinks the sons of the Duke will start fighting over who will be the successor of the Duke. He envisions that the county chiefs of each county in mission will have to choose between siding with Lord Curran, who is the older son of the Duke, or Lord Vasmark, who is the younger son of the Duke. He figures out that Lord Lumiere, who is the chief of Canar County, is likely to side with the older son and he informs Ars they have to follow the chief's decision when the time comes. He advises Ritsu to be ready to depart from the castle at a moment's notice, because the chief is likely to call for a lord's meeting to determine their next course of action. Lord Raven tells them he'll also prepare to leave, but when he tries to get out of bed, his body fails him and he falls back down in agony. Later that day, Ritsu receives a letter from Chief Lumiere and he presents it to Ars, who reads the letter, Lord Lumiere wants them to come over to Canar County in three days and Ritsu offers to go in place of Lord Raven with Charlotte. Since he was feeling under the weather, Ars declines his request because he wants to represent his father himself. On the appointed day, Ars arrives in Canar with Charlotte and Ritsu as his escorts. Ars was nervous because he didn't know the kind of person he'll be dealing with as the county chief of Canar. they head into the city's gate, where a guard is standing to check the people coming into the city. Ars approaches the guard and introduces himself to him, he shows him the letter of invitation from the chief of the county of Canar, and he explains that he's visiting the city on behalf of his father. The guard confirms that the letter is genuine, but he wonders if Ars is really from the Luvent family because he didn't envision they'll send a child to replace them. 
Charlotte wonders if the guard is doubting their authenticity and the guard recognizes her as the flame princess of the Luvent family, the guard quickly also recognizes Ritsu as the grim reaper of the Luvent family, and Ars is surprised by the unorthodox nicknames given to his escorts. Ritsu informs the guard that he doesn't like the name because it makes him out to be a dangerous person, but Ars knows that the name fits his persona because he's indeed dangerous. Ars convinces the guard to let them through since he knows who they are and the guard obeys, he lets them through the gate and leads them to the castle. Ars looks around nervously as they walk through the castle and Charlotte notices that he's nervous, she points this out to him and he apologizes for losing his nerves. They are welcomed by Minas Renard, the vassal of Lord Lumiere, and Eris introduces himself to Minas, telling him he's come in place of his father. Minas figures out that Lord Raven is truly ill and he prays for his speedy recovery. Ars uses his appraisal skill on Minas and he notices that he has high average stats, which makes him a good all-rounder. Minas tries to convince Charlotte and Ritsu to come over to Kanar Castle because he's heard about their exploits. Ars is surprised by the sudden proposal, but Ritsu and Charlotte turn him down because they've already sworn loyalty to the Luvent family. Minas is disappointed that he didn't get to them early enough, but he's glad they are serving in a nice family. Ars thanks him for his compliment and Minas tells them it is time to meet the other lords so they don't keep them waiting. He leads them to the door of the meeting room, which Ars opens up and they enter. Ars introduces himself to the lord and he informs them he's representing his father Lord Raven, who is the mayor of Lambert. No one says anything in response, so Ars decides to rush over to his seat and sit down before his knees give way under him because of the pressure in the room. He wonders why the lords are silent and he thinks they don't regard him because he is a child's, Kral Orsil recognizes Ars as the son of Lord Raven, and he compliments his greetings. Ars recognizes Kral as the Lord of Barony of Khmer, and he remembers that he used to play with him when he was a kid. Ars tells Kral he should be the one giving him his greeting, but Kral is so glad to see that Ars is all grown up, so he offers him some cookies to help him relax. Ars appreciates his gesture, but he notices another lord glaring intently at him, and he gets nervous again. The doors of the room open up, and everyone stands up and bow in reverence as Lord Lumiere, the chief of the county of Kanar walks in. He thanks everyone for coming, and Ars uses his appraisal skill to check out his statistics. He sees he has a high diplomacy skill value, but he realizes it's not too flashy. He suddenly notices that Minas, the chief's facile, makes up for whatever the chief lacks, and he concludes that they'll both be able to get the right solution for any problems of the county if they work together. Lord Lumiere apologizes for bringing everyone in on such short notice, but he wanted to pass some information in person. He tells them that war is bound to break out now that the Duke of Mission has been assassinated and he tells them the county of Kanar will side with Lord Kuran, the older son. Lord Lumiere asks for any objections to his decision, but everyone present agrees with him. He also informs them of rumors that the Duchy of States could seize the opportunity to attack them, and he advises them to prepare their forces for the coming war. While the other lords are sending messages to their territories, Ars just keeps sitting in his seat because he's so nervous. Lord Lumiere walks up to him and Ars apologizes for his rudeness, but Lord Lumiere only wanted to extend his greetings to Lord Raven. Ars thanks him for his concern, but Lord Lumiere praises him for representing his father well, despite being just 11 years. He knew Lamberg had a high military strength despite being a small territory, and he tells Ars to do his best in the coming times of war because he's counting on him. He extends such expectations to Ritsu and Charlotte too, and they all assure him they'll give their best. Lord Lumiere walks away from the meeting, and they all make a silent promise not to fail him. The Lord, who was glaring at Ars earlier calls out to him and he introduces himself as Lord Hammond. Ars recognizes him as the Lord of Barony of Torbequista and Ligia's father. Ars wonders why the Lord walked up to him and the Lord informs him that Ligia has been in a bad mood since she returned because she was dissatisfied with her interactions with him. Though Ars wonders what he did wrong, he apologizes for being the cause of his daughter's foul mood. Lord Hammond asks Ars if he has responded to his daughter's letter, and Ars remembers he wasn't able to write a response because his father fell ill and then the Duke got assassinated, so he hasn't had time to himself. He tells Lord Hammond that he hasn't replied and the Lord is disappointed to hear that Ars promises to send a reply once he returns home. The Lord realized his daughter liked Ars because she previously behaved without emotion, but recently she had been expressive and obvious. Lord Hammond confesses that he didn't give her enough attention when she was younger after he noticed how smart she was, this made Ligia lonely because he chose to prioritize his work as a Lord instead of giving her the attention a child deserves. 
Lord Hammond was just hoping Lygia could be happy because she witnessed different quarrels between aristocrats and their territory when she was younger, which gave her a hard time. Lord Hammond knows he's to blame for this, but he couldn't help glaring at ours for toying with his daughter's feelings. He apologizes for this because he recognizes Lord Raven as a fierce warrior and he can rest assured that Lygia will be safe with his son, that's why he gave her permission to marry him. He pleads with Ars to take care of his daughter, and Ars promises to do his best to make her happy. Lord Hammond walks away and Ars realizes he cares about his daughter. They return home and Ars informs Lord Raven of the information passed at the meeting. He's not surprised with Lord Lemire's decision, but he tells Ars he didn't expect him to go to the meeting in person. Ars thinks his father is displeased with his actions, but he gets a complimentary pat on the head as his father commends him for his maturity. He thanks his father for the compliment, and he proceeds to his room to write a response letter to Lygia. He tells her the reason he couldn't write back to her immediately, but he also informs her that he met her father. He hoped their families would be able to work together during the war, but he was worried about her welfare now that tensions were high. He remembers his promise to her father to win the war so he can protect her. So, the next morning, he decides to train with Ritsu. Ritsu knocks him down, but he gets back up to his feet to continue because he wants to be able to do the bare minimum when war eventually breaks out. Ritsu advises him to rest since they've been training all morning, but Ars urges him to continue because he's still in good condition. Ars is disappointed that he wasn't getting better while everyone else was improving, he remembered the disastrous result of the mock battle. He led some troops to which made him realize he doesn't have any practical experience of war. He recalled how he flinched when he saw soldiers approaching him, and though he was sure Ritsu and Charlotte would help him, he didn't want to destroy the troops' morale on the battlefield by his lack of confidence. He knew that it would be pointless to lead an army of powerful people if he was weak. Roselle suddenly runs up to him and informs him that the Lord of the Barony of Khmer is asking for their help because the Duchy of Scythes sent an invasion force to their territory. Ars remembers that Lord Kral is in charge of that territory, but Ritza figures out that they can't stay out of the battle because they're close to Khmer and they'll be next on the invasion list. Ars realized it was time for him to go into battle because his father was in no condition to lead the troops. He gets the jitters, but he informs them that he'll be leading the troops and he asks them to assemble in the courtyard, Ritza promises to help him win his first battle. After the troops gather, Ars begins to give them the infamous war speech, but his father suddenly cuts him off because he's not old enough to go to war. Lord Raven decides to lead the troops, but Ars reminds him that he's sick and can't go to war. Lord Raven tells Ars he'll give his life to protect the future of the county of Kanar. Ritsu tries to make a case for Ars, but Lord Raven tells him to stay out of it. Ars tries to convince Lord Raven that they'll win because he has Ritsu and Charlotte by his side, but Lord Raven tells him the problem is that Ars doesn't have the warrior face. Lord Raven realizes that Ars doesn't know what he's talking about, so he asks his soldiers to bring out a criminal for his execution. He tells Ars the criminal has committed heinous crimes, but his illness delayed the execution. He tells Ars to watch as he executes the criminal, and he promises to recognize Ars as a warrior and let him lead the troops into battle if he remains calm. Ars wonders how his father expects him to remain calm when a man is being executed in front of him, but the criminal tells him he gets the best feeling when he takes innocent lives, just like Ars's. Lord Raven gives the order to carry out the execution, and though Ars tries to keep his cool, he gets nauseous and he throws up. Lord Raven concludes that Ars cannot lead the troops so he decides to lead them himself. Ars's companions rush over to his side to comfort him, but Lord Raven tells them to follow him because they need to head into battle. As they walk away, leaving Ars on his knees, he realizes that he's truly not ready for war. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching. Want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.